Have you ever heard the bird noise at Chichen Itza? If you clap at the base of El Castillo, this pyramid that's got the undulating snake going down the side, it makes this chirping noise. Now, if you're aware of this phenomenon, but you haven't been to Chichen Itza, like myself, then you may well have seen this video. But did you pay close attention to what the tour guide said? Experts from different countries, experts in acoustics, have come here to study, to, to try to, to know how this is possible. They leave the country just like they... <laughs> well, that seems a little weird, doesn't it? Scientists that specialize in sound can't figure this out? A yeah, quick search on Google and you find out that's not actually true. The acoustics experts have figured out how this makes a sound. Surprise, surprise. Matter of fact, they've figured out that lots of the temples have similar things going on, but they're pretty sure that this one was built deliberately to emulate the sound of a specific bird. Anyway, so why such a specific falsehood? Why doesn't he just say, hey, you know, it's pretty crazy that these guys figured out how to do it way back when. Scientists thought it was pretty impressive too, but instead he says it's a mystery. Well, that's bad enough, but does this thing stretch from like tour guides to the public portrayal of science in maybe a more professional sense? Let's talk about that for a second. Hi, my name's Dan and welcome to Dunking. Now, teaching Nietzsche isn't the only place you're going to find tour guides telling tall tales. Matter of fact, it seems if you look online, you'll see tour guides all over the place telling tall tales, and it kind of makes sense. I mean, these are the boots on the ground people whose livelihoods are directly affected by how many people show up. Directly affected, not like when tourist dollars trickle. They see tourists, they make money. So it makes sense that they drum up the mystery. But that's just one example of how information from an archaeological site can get twisted, censored, or ignored for ulterior motives. I mean, if you've seen Ancient Apocalypse, you no doubt remember the part when Graham Hancock complained about being banned from filming at Serpent Mound. And while I completely support the Native American right to keep people from filming on their land, it's their land, uh, reading the letter is a little telling. This is a sacred American Indian site. As its caretaker, on behalf of the people of Ohio past and present, and to the American Indian tribes whose ancestors built the mounds, our role is to ensure that Serpent Mound's integrity and preservation, both physically and in its historical interpretation, are maintained. This also applies to all of our sacred American Indian sites, including Miamisburg Mound and Fort Hill Earthwork and Nature Reserve. Because the presenter of this series, Graham Hancock, proposes a theory and story that do not align with what we know to be true about Serpent Mound, your request is declined. Now that last part may be pretty harsh, but it's just Hancock, right? So who cares? Well, no, it's not actually just Hancock. Archaeologists, anthropologists, and the indigenous tribes of America have squared off with, about archaeological finds for a very long time. Kennewick Man was kind of the time that it came to a serious head, although there was already some laws around it at the time. The court battle there was pretty big. But um, it settled into a little bit of a truce, but not completely. Dr. Robinson Bonickson, director of the Center of the Study of the First Americans at Oregon State University in Corvallis, was excavating a 10,000-year-old archaeological site in Montana several years ago when his team discovered that the area was littered with ancient human hairs. The archaeologists realized with excitement that the hairs' DNA content could be studied for clues about the origins of the prehistoric people who once lived there. But almost as soon as the discovery was announced in 1993, two nearby Indian tribes, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai and the Shoshone Bannock, demanded the research stop. Even though no human burials were found at the site, the Indians considered the research sacrilegious and wanted the hair turned over to them under the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, which allows tribes to claim the remains of their ancestors. The Federal Bureau of Land Management, which controlled the site, barred the archaeologists from it and forbade analysis of the hair already gathered. Further down the article, we find this quote, We never asked science to make a determination as to our origins, said Sebastian Lebeau, repatriation officer for the Cheyenne River Sioux. We know where we came from. Now that article was written during the height of Kennewick Man, so it might have been embellished a little bit, but it does claim there were hundreds of instances. And we do know that there are a lot of other times. I mean, much more recently we had this, for example. The Reno Sparks Indian Colony is asking a California-headquartered archaeological firm to stop digging at a site considered sacred to Nevada tribes. Far Western Anthropological Research Group Incorporated began excavation work at Thacker Pass this month, an area about 35 miles south of the Oregon-Nevada border. The dig is part of a planned mine by Lithium Nevada, a subsidiary of Canada-owned Lithium Americas that must be completed before construction of the mine can move forward. Several tribes, including the Reno Sparks Indian Colony and the Winnemucca Indian Colony in Nevada, have gone to court in an effort to halt any excavation and construction at Thacker Pass. However, a judge ruled against those tribes. 
Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the indigenous Americans should let archaeologists piss all over the graves of their ancestors, if that's how they view this. They should have every right and should have every right to protect their own people. But I'm bringing this up to point out that this has been and continues to be a roadblock to archaeology, finding out the data that it needs and pushing forward. There are, it's not just Hancock that's stopped by the Native American tribes, it is archaeologists as well. We see a somewhat similar issue in Malta in regards to the beliefs of the native people. There matters more to the public than what the science has to say. If you remember on Ancient Apocalypse when Graham Hancock spoke about those Neanderthal teeth that they found like 100 years before they were dated and there was like 50 years of time that they could have dated them, 70 years, and they didn't. And it actually took a private citizen, basically a, a pediatrician of all things, to like finance and push to get these things finally dated. And when they did, yeah, it looks like they're Neanderthal teeth. And all of a sudden there's pushback from some, from some people, archaeologists. And they're like, well, yeah, local archaeologists, mind you. And they're like, well, yeah, those are probably Neanderthal teeth, maybe. But that doesn't mean that Neanderthal settled here. It could have been washed in by floods, blah, blah, blah. And it's just kind of weird. It's like, why did you guys not want to date these to begin with? Why did one guy have to push for it? Well, there's a kind of a weird thing going on in Malta. You have those temples that they talked about again in Ancient Apocalypse. That they're on the island of Govo, I believe it's pronounced. And those temples are, they're a matter of cultural pride. And the people there believe that their ancestors are the ones that built them. The science is clear that they're not. It's, there's been two different groups of people that have inhabited the island, and the first group built those, and they died off or left, or a combination of both. And the second group is the people that are not the builders of the island, of those temples. But that's not what the tourism guides say. A tourist article written by a local says, A topic that has caused much debate and created also a lot of theories is definitely how our prehistoric ancestors managed to build such amazing and complex structures without the aid of any technology. Speaking about Giganti and the other temples. As a cute little side note, this also has a section about the Malta Atlantis theory, which I'll put up on the screen here for a moment so you can uh, take a look at. Why don't you put on your Indiana Jones hat and try your hand at making the connection? In another article, we see the history kind of sidestepped here where it says that Malta has been inhabited for almost 8,000 years. And this is, again, a tourist article. And uh, Malta has kind of been inhabited for 8,000 years in three different waves with like chunks in between with no people there supposedly so that's not exactly accurate and it implies that it's one continuous thing when it hasn't been one continuous thing. And cultural identity isn't the only reason that that kind of stuff happens in Malta. I mean, the way that these science can sometimes be portrayed to the public can be a little bit off in the fact that tourism is so heavy there. So you will find people saying that Malta was Atlantis. You will find people saying that Paul was there, St. Paul was there. You will find people saying that the Odyssey have, talks about Malta. You'll, you'll find all kinds of things like that because it drums up money, period, end of story. So it's kind of hard to trust what comes out of there unless you're looking at a very close lens. And to go back to what the we saw when they're in the discussion with Hancock, they may well not let you dig if they think you're not going to come up with the stuff that they like. Now, I can't say that with certainty, but the more that something leans that direction, the more possible it is that they're going to censor digs and other associated science with it. If it's going to step on their toes, they might not want it to happen. Now, another place where cultural identity and tourism dovetailed to make for some sketchy science is Ganong Padang. Now, I just spoke about this a couple of videos ago, so I won't go too terribly into detail about it. But basically, the president, the last president, not the sitting one, he was all on board with the idea that Indonesia was the seat of Atlantis. And he financed digs at Ganong Padang and pushed people to do it. And it was done in a rushed, haphazard manner. And a lot of scientists have complained about the manner that it was done in. And it's sketchy as hell, the conclusions that were came out of there with. But the tourism sites, oh, they've got no problem talking about this being a 25,000-year-old pyramid or alluding to it. A shocking discovery. There are many prehistoric megalithic sites in Indonesia, but the discovery of Ganong Padang made geologists and scientists around the world open their eyes. The discoveries shocked the world of sciences, archaeology, and anthropology because it could change our common knowledge about history. It is like a big elephant entering a crowded anthropology classroom. Two things that shocked the world about its age and the size of the site. The age. The site has five terraces slash layers. Each layer has each age. According to the radiocarbon dating test, the first layer could be approximately 3,500 to 5,000 years old. 
Beta Analytic Laboratory, Miami, Florida, USA, tested the 5 to 12 meter deep samples, and the result is the samples of the site dated between 14,500 and 25,000 BC. And another tourist site, it's a little more subtle, but it tells you if you've never heard of it, Ganong Padang is located in Desu Karamek, Bujar, West, West Java. It's located in West Java. It is probably around 120 kilometers from that Jakarta. I can say that, Jakarta. Reading about Ganong Padang and the result of the several surveys done here made me realize this is an extraordinary site. In fact, the site is almost as old, if not older, than the ancient Egyptian civilization. According to most archaeologists, Ganong Padang was built over four different eras and it is amazing to think about how well preserved the site is. Most archaeologists believe it was built in four layers. No. <laughs> most archaeologists believe the fourth layer and the third layer are not cultural layers and the second layer's dating is questionable. That's just an outright fabrication. But it sure gets good tourism dollars, doesn't it? And you can only imagine that if you go back to that previous president that had the big thing for Ganong Padang and Atlantis and all that, Imagine if you were a more skeptical type of archaeologist and you were petitioning him to dig over there. Do you think he'd say yeah, or do you think he'd hear something like what Hancock heard from the Native American tribes? Now, personally, I think this happens the worst in Egypt. You may remember back in the 90s when they sent the robot up the shaft in the Queen's Chamber, and the German guy hit the wall and they pulled him off the job. They're like, oh, cool, you found something. Now get out of here. And they sent some of the other robots up later, and they've done more investigations, but at the time, they stopped everything. Right about the same time, they did all these seismic studies around the Sphinx. And they found what looked to be a chamber. It was all over the news. And then, <sighs> nope, stop. Now, this kind of stuff made news back then. It went around. It was a big deal. It was manufactured intrigue. One example would be Zahi Hawass and his connections to the Edgar Casey Foundation. When he was let go, the Edgar Casey Foundation threw a big old stinky fit and cried about how terrible it was. When he came back, they were all happy and proud of it. And they talked about how he was going to come and speak at one of their conferences. Now, Mark Leonard was put through school by the Edgar Casey Foundation, and he's spoken about this a little bit in public. But the two of them having connections to this Wu factory while being so skeptical themselves does seriously invite some of that tinfoil hat speculation. Maybe they're the Smithsonian. Maybe they're the ones that are stealing the artifacts and funneling them all to Edgar Casey Foundation. Maybe, you see what I'm saying? It, it, it can get kind of crazy. And maybe this has nothing at all to do with their connections to the Edgar Casey Foundation. Maybe Mark Leonard was genuinely a pyramid idiot until he started going to college and learning more. Maybe Zahi Hawass just goes anywhere that people will pay him to talk. Maybe he doesn't give a shit. But the thing is, is that you have to scratch the surface just a hair to find this stuff. But when you do, it's glaring. It's apparent. So this is the kind of thing that it feels like manufactured intrigue. It feels like the kind of secret you're supposed to find. And when you do, you're supposed to go, hmm, if you're the kind of person that thinks that way. Now, I know it's a lot bigger of a deal to accuse an archaeologist or two than it is to accuse a tour guide of misleading the public for money. But we have clips like this of Zahi Hawass. There is anything bad in Egypt. This new age people, they come. They don't care. It's imagination. It's a dream. Leave them to live in dream. And Leonard has this public track record of screwing up attempts to like recreate the way Egyptians did things. And, you know, he could test these things out before he went and put them out on the internet or put them out into the world, but he doesn't. It's almost like he wants you to see these things fail. Onto the sand and causes the cutting. The crystal is forced to score a groove in the stone. So the copper is only guiding the sand. The sand's doing the cutting. Right. Now, Dennis, will we see any progress in our lifetime? Yes. Um, if you came back in an hour's time, you would see about a four millimeter cut down into the stone. You're kidding. In an hour, you'll be four millimeters down? And both of these guys, despite being very public that they think that the Giza Plateau pyramids were built in the fourth dynasty, almost never mention the carbon dating. And they, they, they don't employ it when they're talking about that. You don't ever hear them like saying, these are the reasons those guys are wrong. They never list the carbon dating. And you would think they would because that's a smoking gun, right? Anybody of, of us would realize that is the smoking gun in that argument. Well, they've been dated to this. Pfft, goodbye. But they don't do that. In my opinion, the main reason so few people are aware the pyramids have been radiocarbon tested is because those tests have been intentionally downplayed by Giza spokespersons Mark Lehner and Zahi Hawass. 
In their Definitive History book about Giza, published in 2017, there is but a single sentence mentioning carbon testing has taken place, and no citation for it is provided. Now, the spiritual attraction of the pyramids does have a lot to do with that Edgar Cayce antediluvian. These things are ancient as ancient can be. So, yeah, dating them would put a little dent in that um, idea. So, it does make sense. It would be something they would just try to hide a little bit. This has been going on for a little while now. I mean, traditionally, tourism has made up a far larger percentage of Egypt's GDP than it does most other nations. So it does make sense that they're trying to bump those numbers up a little bit, especially when you look at 2008, they had a bombing. Right after that, they had the coup. Just recently, we had the Rona. And you can see on the graph, all those things hit their bottom line. So it's not surprising that muon detectors were placed in the Great Pyramid to look for a hidden chamber that they found, nor is it surprising that Zahi Hilwas is on Netflix trying to talk about a new pyramid that he just found. Basically, their tourism numbers are way down, and they're trying to I pump those numbers up. Those are rookie numbers in this racket. And getting people to look closer plays right into that, even if what we're looking for doesn't exist. They don't care if it's a red herring. It still pays the same. Show up here, give us 10 grand, and come look at the mysteries that we've already solved, but we're not going to tell you about, even though there is some real mysteries there. And you know, they have historians and archaeologists and Atlantis hunters and authors and all kinds of journalists and whatnot that have been going to Egypt for a very long time that they could kind of count on even when regular tourism's down. But they've got another person that's been added to this whole mix. I'll end this whole video with the quick metaphor that. I think most people understand because we'll talk about video games. Now we've seen something recently with the whole uh, console scalping thing that it used to be console scalping would last for like six months or so through the Christmas season, but this PS5, Xbox One, S, 1472 generation, that scalping lasted like two freaking years, man. What's up with that? Well, we got a lot more people nowadays that are trying to be social media influencers. A pathetic group of people, by the way. But anyway. <coughs> Anyway, those people, uh, they're, they're kind of stuck, right? I mean, you, what are you going to do? You're going to get on the internet and like stream freaking Grand Theft Auto 5 on a PS4 when the PS5's out? When the, who's going to watch you? Nobody's going to watch you, so you need the PS5. Even if it's three times what it should be, you need that PS5. So these guys, they, 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 they fed that. Now, my deal is you extrapolate that to this sphere of pathetic social media influencers and I mean, going to the pyramids is kind of a rite of passage for us, right? I mean, if, if one of these dudes makes it big, they, they go and check out the pyramids. And don't get me wrong, I have nothing against that. I would love very much to go to Egypt myself. So don't forget to check out my Patreon, watch all the ads twice, click the bell. Any, anyway, my point is, is that they can count on that. They can count on a certain number of people that are showing up there to just check things out, to post a picture on Instagram, to post a short video on TikTok, to post a YouTube video, to, and it makes sense. It totally makes sense. So even when things are a little crappy, they can play into that. But the mystery side of that is heavy. Who wants to go to a site that's not mysterious? You don't see people going and checking out the sites that everybody knows about. It's the ones that they'll be like, oh, we've got some intrigue here. So they drum that up. Now, I know this sounds kind of tinfoil hat, but we do have to be careful of this. When tourism, nationalism, and archaeology meet, the people disseminating the information oftentimes just decide that archaeology loses. And normally that's like a tourist guide or somebody like that, somebody writing an article to get people to come to their country and check stuff out, or somebody who's like proud of their nation or proud of their people. But sometimes... It's actually the archaeologists like we have in Egypt. And in that situation, you could say that Graham Hancock is right. You can't trust these guys. Well, thank you so very much for watching this far. I really do appreciate it. I want to say a special thanks to all my patrons right there. My numbers keep growing with that, which is just amazing. I love you guys to death. You give me confidence as well. So thank you very much. Um, don't forget to do all those things, and we will see you next time. Ibiat, 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 ibiat,